episode in which we begin to investigate or run roughshod over, I should say, the man called Socrates. Now, again, the whole point of this particular podcast is to go over uh, roughly, again, roughshod, uh, the history of philosophy, but to do so um, by looking at these philosophical ideas, these thinkers, and then also engaging them from a somewhat theistic uh, perspective, specifically Christian for the most part, um, just to oversimplify. So what we're going to do is start today with Socrates, like we said. Now, the history of philosophy does not start with Socrates. Obviously, there is a period uh, before this thinker called the pre-Socratics. Uh, of course, this encompasses a wide range of uh, of thinkers, uh, from uh, Parmenides to Heraclitus to uh, Xenophanes, all, all sorts of other guys. And they had a lot of things to offer, uh, a lot of very interesting uh, arguments for this, that, and the other. Um, but we're not going to go through, the, through those because, again, we're trying to run roughshod, and we're going to have so much material already to try to go through uh, from the time of Socrates up until around the contemporary period. Um, now, as we begin to talk about Socrates, Again, one, keep in mind that this is just uh, a rough over, overview, but then two, keep in mind that we're just going to look at, at one or two of his, his, his uh, main contributions uh, to the foundations of philosophy. But before we do that, we do have to back up a little in the sense to see that a lot of Socrates, uh, a lot of his thought, a lot of his, his, uh, his ideology comes about as a reaction to uh, just just like almost any other philosopher, uh, uh, whatever period we're in, comes about as a reaction to what was going on before him. Um, before Socrates, again, in the pre-Socratic period, there was a, like we said, a group of or more philosophers uh, that existed, that uh, spoke of, that, that uh, talked about important matters. But there was also a group that would be called the sophists. Um, these would be, again, to oversimplify, to overgeneralize quite a bit, um, these would be roughly equivalent to our modern day relativists, uh, those who uh, want to argue that there is no objective truth, that want to constantly critique some sort of a authority or traditional type uh, uh, position. Now, again, these guys did have something important to offer. I mean, of course, they helped advance our, our understanding of knowledge, epistemology, um, uh, authoritarian type structures, and when and if they should be questioned, those sorts of things. But this also, again, going to the extreme, um, just to call in uh, to question the even existence of objectivity as a, as a category in, as regard as regard as it pertains to truth, uh, things of that nature. Socrates was reacting to a lot of this. Of course, what makes Socrates stand out um, is his humility. Um, he always puts himself in the position of the questioner or the learner, we should say. He, he, he presents himself as, as one who wants to try to find out uh, what is going on. He wants to find out what people believe and why they believe it. Um, he, 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 he wants to understand what does someone mean when they say something like a man is just or a man is virtuous or so-and-so is a man of wisdom. What does it mean to say uh, that a man is a man of wisdom? What is wisdom? What is justice? What is, what is, it, what is it to be virtuous? Um, what, is, what is virtuous? What is the essence of that, of virtue? And so he, he, he constantly puts himself in this, in this role as if you are the teacher and he himself is the learner. Now, the brilliance of Socrates was that by doing so, he's essentially guiding the conversation. And this is what we want to look at uh, as, it, as, as it regards Socrates. We're going to look at his method of doing this, which was called or which has become to be known as uh, the Socratic method, and Plato later, later goes on to call this something like the dialectic. Um, and then we're going to look at his method of argument. 
Now, as we go through this, especially if you're a member of the CAA um, or if you're familiar with, with Greg Kokel uh, and his, his, uh, his profession, Stand to Reason, then this should sound very, very similar to you. Um, in fact, I haven't had the opportunity to ask uh, Greg this, but I've always wanted to, to ask him if he's, if he's developed his, uh, one of his particular strategies directly off the Socratic method, because it, it, it's almost just verbatim <laughs> Socratic method put into everyday practice or with a modern spin. Now, I would also suggest that if you have some sort of um, philosophy text that you could follow along with, something like a history of philosophy like Fred, by Frederick uh, Cobbleston, or even what I'll be using primarily is just a text that I had uh, during, during a, uh, during my school school time was The Voyage of Discovery by William Lawhead. Um, I found that text to be uh, just tremendous as far as an overview uh, and an introductory type text to the history of philosophy. In fact, some of you, if you're enrolled at uh, SES, you probably are using uh, a text like this under Dr. Bridges. Also a text that I'll have open today, uh, just to, to make a few points out of, again, not much, is just uh, Peter Kreft's Socratic Logic. Now, what this, what that particular textbook is for is just the study of Aristotelian logic, uh, you know, your deductive type syllogisms and things of that nature. But he, he wants to, he does this from a very liberal arts sort of uh, position. So he, he has a lot about Socrates and the Socratic method within that text. And then especially at the end, just some practical application as it pertains to the Socratic method. So having said that, let's look at Socrates. So he, he goes around. He's constantly getting in trouble. In fact, he's called the gadfly of Athens or the, or the horse fly, as we would, as we would say the word now, um, because he's constantly aggravating. He's constantly uh, upsetting in a good sense, uh, in, 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 in a good way, the people, the populace. Uh, he roams around. He's asking questions. He's asking questions of people that um, really – thought that they were above being questioned. Now, the youth of that day um, were enamored with the sophists <clears throat> because the sophists were not afraid to go around and, and question authority all the time and, and cause quite a stink by doing so. But they also, and at least in some way, were enamored by Socrates because he was doing this too. Now, granted, he was doing this from what we would say would be a healthy uh, perspective. He's really trying to gain understanding as opposed to the, to the sophists. Now, so Socrates, his method, again, is the first is going to be this, something like the Socratic, his, his mode of questioning. So let me read a few points, <clears throat> excuse me, out of Lawhead's text here. So he's going to, he's going to meet someone. He's going to meet you and say uh, a party or, or a, 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 some sort of political event or some sort of public gathering. Um, and what he's going to do is he's going to start to ask you questions. He's going to try to draw you out on where you stand in regards to some particular position. And then when you start to use terms, he's going to ask you what you mean by those terms. So if someone were to say, uh, you know, this particular political candidate is wise, he'd say, OK, all right, I understand that you think he's wise and he may be. But what do you mean by wise? What does that term mean to you? And so he starts to ask these types of questions to, again, to draw them out. What he's going to do is, again, he's going to play as if he's the ignorant one, as if he's the one that has no clue as to what's going on, and he's trying to ask you essentially to teach him uh, what your particular position is. Now, what he's going to do, and this is where it should sound very familiar to you if you're familiar with Greg Kokel's book, Tactics, is Socrates is the originator of the Colombo tactic. This is what Socrates... Uh, this was this was his bread and butter. This is where he made his his impact was again. Let's go through uh, Greg Kokel's uh, Colombo tactic. What is that? Kokel's Colombo tactic again. You're probably familiar with it. Is the first question you want to gain information when you're talking with someone. So how do you do that? You would say, well, what do you mean by that? So and so is a wise person. Oh, wait a minute, what do you mean by wise? Okay, and then it clarifies what the person is making. It tells, it, it gives you an idea of what they're thinking. And of course, this, you know, as Google states, it's just a good conversation starter. 
Now, here's where it takes a turn. And just like Socrates, the next question in, in Kogel's Colombo ta tactic is, how did you come to that conclusion? Or what is your evidence for that? Or what kind of reasons led you to hold that particular, uh, hold to that persuasion? Now, what that happens is that it comes in the form of a question. Now, this is exactly what Socrates, Socrates does, is he draws out, he tries to see what people mean by some particular term, by some particular uh, proposition, or whatever what they mean by that. Then he asks them roughly, why do you believe that? Or how did you come to believe that? And then what he does, what Socrates does, when he notices that this person is going through their reason or they're clarifying their term or they're going through whatever, whatever for whatever reason they hold that particular per, per, uh, uh, perspective, just like uh, Kogel's Colombo tactic, the next question is, can you clear this up for me? That's Kogel's next question. And the point of that is what? Kogel says the point of that is to exploit a flaw or to begin, uh, or to, to begin to analyze their position so that they see the inherent flaw or the inherent contradiction in their uh, ideology, or at least the reasons why they're holding to that particular uh, ideology or particular persuasion. But this is exactly almost to a T, what Socrates did. Socrates would ask a question in order to expose the weakness in his opponent's uh, argument. And I shouldn't even, again, I shouldn't even necessarily say opponent here because remember Socrates is just trying to, he really is trying to get to the truth of things. He's trying to get people to evaluate uh, their beliefs. He's really trying to get people to see why they believe what they believe. So it might be too strong a word to say that call them his opponents, because at this point in time, it's really just his fellow conversations. Granted, he is trying to challenge um, and, and, and to dig down uh, to see why they hold to what they hold. So let, let me read this, uh, this little quick section out of Lawhead's text to show how he does this. So here it goes. This is Lawhead's text. Second, Socrates attacks his companions uh, proposition by employing the form of argument we now call reductio ad absurdum. Or, of course, that's Latin for just meaning reducing to the absurd. Now, to use this technique, you begin by assuming that your opponent's position is true. And then you show that if that's true, that it logically implies either an absurd conclusion or one that contradicts itself or other conclusions held by uh, his opponent, Socrates' opponent. So this is how uh, Socrates does this in, uh, in regard, regarding his conversation with a sophist called uh, Thersmachus. He puts forth this cynical thesis that, one, this is what, this is what his, Socrates' opponent says. He says that justice means doing what is in the interest of those in power. That's how his, uh, Socrates' opponent, uh, op uh, opponent here uh, defines justice. Oh, what is justice? Well, justice is doing what is in the interest of those in power. Now, Socrates then elicits the following corollary to the definition from Thasmagus. He says, two, to be just is to obey the laws of those in power. All right. So then next, Socrates has him agree to the common sense observation that what? Well, that three, that those in power can make mistakes. Is this true or not? Well, Socrates' interlocutor says, yeah, well, that, yeah, of course, yes, those in power can make mistakes. Well, from that, now here's the key, from that, the following two inferences may be drawn. Those in power may mistakenly make laws that are not in their own interests. And to obey such laws is not to act in the interest of those in power. So what Socrates done here, Socrates has shown that his opponent's definition of justice, if taken to its, its logical conclusion, elicits a contradiction. How? Well, how? Because it does it this way. Therefore, to be just is to do what is in the interest of those in power and because those in power can make mistakes and make laws that aren't in, that don't help them at all, that aren't in their interests, it can also be just to do what is not in the interest of those in power. So let's run over that again. Socrates' opponent says, one, justice means doing what is in the interest of those in power. 
To be just is to obey the laws of those in power. Okay. So Socrates makes it clear. He says, well, wait a minute. Can't they, those in power make mistakes? His opponent says, well, sure, they can make mistakes. Well, all right. Well, if those in power may, may mistakenly make laws that are not in their own interest, and to obey such laws is not to act in the interest of those in power, well, you've got a contradiction. Because therefore, to be just is to do what is in the interest of those in power, and to be just is to do what is not in interest to, the, to do those in power, because you're following those laws that they made, even though they made a mistake. So essentially, Socrates is saying, wait a minute, if your definition of justice includes this radical contradiction, then how can that make any sense at all? So, of course, what happens is, 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 is his uh, opponent there is not made to look stupid, but he's made, to sh he's made it, it, it's shown that his definition is just not adequate. It's just not adequate at all. Now, how did Socrates do this? That's the, the key to the Socratic method. He did this by questioning, by asking his terms. What does his opponent mean by fill in the blank? Then asking him to clarify that position, asking him how he came to hold that particular position. And then again, with questions, that's the key, with questions, he points out the flaw. He points out the flaw or the contradiction, um, sometimes with a counterexample and sometimes with what we would call a reductio ad absurdum. Now, just as a, as a brief side note, a reductio ad absurdum, just for those that may not be familiar with that, this is just a form of argument that you hear all of the time. You probably just didn't know that it actually had a name. And again, what is it? A reductio ad absurdum is just that form of argument that you take if that particular position is true, what somebody's arguing for, if you use that same, use the same principles that they're, that, that they're employing, that the logical consequence is some sort of ridiculous conclusion or a contradictory conclusion. Now, what's the most famous example of a reductio ad absurdum? Your mom or your dad used this, your grandmother, your entire life, and you didn't know it. The whole, hey, can I go to this party? No, you can't go to this party. Well, so-and-so is going to the party. Well, if so-and-so jumped off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge too? Now you think, well, that's ridiculous. Really? No, that's a valid sort of argument. I mean, then the argument, that's a reductio ad absurdum. It's saying that if your reason to go to the party is because so-and-so is going to the party, if that's your reason, if that's your argument to, that you should be able to go, well, then if that's true, that you should be able to go because so-and-so is, well, then it would also be, tr also be true that you should jump off a bridge <laughs> because so-and-so is. Of course, that's an absurd. That, of course, that's absurd. That's the point. The point is to show that your argument is absurd or that your argument, uh, if, if taken to its extreme, leads to these, or not extreme, but just to its logical implication, its logical conclusion is absurd. That's the entire point. So when you rolled your eyes at your mom, your grandmother, or whoever, and said, mom, that's ridiculous, that's the point, is that your argument was actually ridiculous. You need a better reason uh, to go to the party or whatever the, the case may be. Now, this is again, this is what Socrates often, oftentimes did. He showed just like if their reason was X, well, then if X is true, you know, or if that's their reason, well, then it would also imply these other ridiculous uh, uh, conclusions, just like here, if justice means this, well, then justice would mean doing uh, the very exact opposite of what you're trying to say it means. So this was, this was the brilliance of Socrates. And um, again, the, the, the funny thing is, is that we see this um, modeled almost to a T with a contemporary spin in Greg Kokel's uh, Colombo tactic. In fact, when I was reading um, Kokel's book, Tactics, um, and it's a good book, I would recommend it, no doubt. I, I, I recall the section and having already gone through uh, Socrates and, and, and some of his some of his studies, some of his works, things of that nature, I remember thinking, clearly, Kokel has had to have, have studied Socrates at some point um, because this is just almost... Uh, identical uh, to the method that Socrates himself uses. Of course, you know, great mind as Kukul is, he, he's, he's no Socrates, so there's no fault in, 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 uh, in using that particular method if that's the way by which he came from it. Now, 
Socrates has a particular theory of knowledge. Um, he has a particular metaphysic. He has views about uh, the human soul. He has views about what constitutes virtue and excellence. And again, I'm going through, just looking through here um, with Lawhead's text, uh, political philosophy, political philosophy. Um, he's got a lot of stuff that he lays down. Now, the difficulty is a lot of historians um, have said that sometimes it's rather difficult to find where Socrates starts and Plato starts. Because the reason for saying this is that, that Plato was the student of Socrates. And of course, Aristotle was the student of Plato. Some have charged that Plato essentially just used Socrates because Socrates was so prominent, such an important figure that, that Socrates was just used by Plato to elaborate on what were actually Plato's own view, on views. Um, but we can, we can, there's good reason to think that a lot of the earlier things that we learn about Socrates really are his, his particular views because of the writing style, because of the, the way things ch seem to change in thought. We can, a lot of historians are, are, are at least somewhat confident that they can, that they can uh, identify where Plato's ideas start to come into play rather than those of Socrates. Now, of course, the way Socrates ends his life or what ends up happening in regards to Socrates is that he's put on trial by his own, his own people for, again, essentially being a troublemaker, that he's questioning authority, that he's, he's corrupting the youth to not worship the gods of his day, um, to worship strange and new gods, all these sorts of things. And long story short, he ends up being uh, killed for his belief. Now, the heroic aspect of that, I, I might suppose, depending on how you look at it, is that Socrates apparently had the the opportunity to escape this this uh, capital punishment, this this execution um, that was uh, merited down on him by a, a jury of his own citizens. However, in, instead of running away or running from this particular fate, as he's been. Uh, as he as it's concluded that he's guilty of all of these charges, he decides to just bite the bullet, or in this case, drink the hemlock uh, that was used to uh, initiate his death. Instead of running from that punishment, instead of trying to get out of that punishment, he decides to go ahead and again drink the hemlock and die for his beliefs rather than run from them or try to escape trouble. Uh, knowing that they'll, it'll just eventually catch up to him again at some later time. Now, of course, this, again, we see the parallel here with, with uh, even Jesus of Nazareth willing to die for the right. Uh, of course, we would say on a much more grand scale, but at the same time, uh, trying to die in the uh, upholding of truth um, as opposed to running and maybe living a little longer life. Um, in some aspect. But as it pertains to Jesus, another interesting point that we might want to say or, or, or a parallel that we see is that even Jesus employs uh, the, Soc the Socratic method at times. We see Jesus asking questions um, as opposed to just making someone sit down and listen to what he has to say. So, for instance, you know, when Jesus is challenged by the Pharisees, uh, you know, should we pay taxes or, or not? And Jesus says, well, whose image is on the coin? Jesus is employing this method of questioning, ask, uh, asking questions to, to lead the conversation, um, to try to bring it to a particular conclusion uh, where he wants it to go, to steer that, um, to steer that conversation, but doing it in the form uh, of, of question asking so that you can lead that, just like the Colombo tactic that the Kukul offers. Now, Peter Kreft, in his book, Socratic Logic, he has a couple, he has an entire section in the Epistles that just say uh, some practical applications of Socratic Logic. One of the most humorous, but probably one of the most beneficial ways to use this particular method, the Socratic method, uh, Peter Kreft says, as, as, as he gives a section, section four in the Epistles, that says how to use the Socratic method on difficult people. <laughs> now, of course, Chris says, now this is not going to be effective in this. 
with a with a raging moon bat than somebody that's just completely, absolutely out of their mind. But that someone, but with someone who really is just a difficult person who's set in their belief, who is um, very adamant that they have things right, uh, and you really do want to try to crack the ice or crack through that hardness in, in order to talk to these to these types of people. Kreft says that the Socratic method is a very valuable to, tool in doing that, and I think he's right. And again, this is. Again, it was it worked in the case of Socrates. It worked in the case of Jesus of Nazareth using uh, the question uh, the question method of, of conversation to, to guide and, and direct and point out flaws in, in someone's ideas. Um, and it can be, you know, just in my own personal experience, it can be uh, very effective in dealing with difficult people. Now, I'm going to highlight some of these parts in uh, – and, and Kreft's text here. So if you want to look at that in depth, I again suggest you look at Socratic Logic by Peter Kreft. So this is what Kreft says, and I'm just, I'm just saying this from the text. His first point is that from the outset, you've got to establish yourself as this, this, this Socratic relationship. That is just to say you're the listener. You're not trying to present yourself as the teacher. You're trying to present yourself as this, the disciple you know, of, of this person, not their opponent one that wants to be shown what they believe, why they believe this. You're really trying to come to clarification on what they, what they, what they think, which is true. Now, two, his second point is that you, you want to get clear what this difficult person, what their basic contention is. What is it? What's their thesis? What's their conclusion? What's their bottom line? So if you were to, to put it in lay terms, you would say, well, what then are they saying? What are you saying? Um, what do you mean by that, as Coco would put it? Now, again, here's where we go by. Again, you see all of these methods, the Socratic method, Coco's Colombo tactic, and, and uh, Peter Kreft's version of how to use the, the Socratic method on difficult people. You, have, you see how, how these all dovetail on one another, how they all overlap here. So Kreft's third point is that you want to be sure that you understand uh, the difficult person's position. So what do you do? You clarify their terms. Now, this is, again, just one of the key principles of just logic when you're examining an argument is you clarify terms. What do they mean by justice? What do they mean by truth? What do they mean by mean? What do they mean by bad? What do they mean by good? What do they mean by ugly? Those sorts of things. Again, four, Chris, again, following the same the same trajectory, the same path here. Socrates, is called the Columbo tactic, four is then find the difficult person's reasons or evidence. Again, here's Kreft's spin on how Socrates does it. Not in the spirit of the inquisitor about to pounce and refute it, but in the spirit, in the spirit of the apprentice being led and instructed by his supposed master. Ask why in this spirit, like a good psychoanalysis. So again, you're just saying, why do you hold this particular position? Or what is your reason for this? How did you come to this conclusion? What, what books did you read that brought you to this? What TV series? What documentary? What, what essays have you read? Whatever. You, know, you can come up with that in your own way. So after, this is his fifth point, after the difficult person's thesis or term and reason is, is clear, you want to be sure to express that back to them in their, in their own words. Why? Because you're just trying to show that you understand what they're saying. So that, that again, that takes that edge off. That takes that... Uh, that, uh, that, that chip off their shoulder that, hey, yeah, this person really does understand what I'm trying to say here. Now, once they see that, as Kreft says, the six points, once this difficult person sees that you're quote unquote their side, you can bet again the next step. You explore either upstream or downstream of their original argument. You can see, you can challenge the premises. Do those really make sense? By again, in the form of questions or you can challenge the consequences. Remember, the implications, maybe by a reductio or ad absurdum, that, well, if this is true, would this not lead to this particular conclusion as well? You know, you might put it that way. Or by way of counterexample. Uh, well, here's an example that seems to completely go against that. How, how, do you, how would you make sense of that? You know, or how do you, how do you reconcile that if, that if that's, you know, conducive to your, uh, your position? And again, you're doing this with questions. You're trying to draw them out to see by themselves, by themselves that their position doesn't make 
much sense or, or that seems contradictory, or at least that there's flaws, that there's serious red flags um, uh, that, they're, that they're holding to. Now, Kreft goes on to point out, I think, two or three more. Uh, actually, he goes on to point out one, two, three, four more points. Uh, how to, how to employ this method. And if you want to look at that, I would, I would obviously suggest that. But again, the, the, the big, the big application here is to emulate or model Socrates, um, and what he held to in regards to how he went about philosophy. Um, because again, we're talking about the ideas of philosophy, but one of the most important aspects about Socrates is how he went about doing philosophy. There's a difference between just knowing what people thought, what individuals thought uh, as it pertains to their ideologies, but it's, an, it's a whole other ball game to be able to do philosophy. And so, you know, in my opinion, this is probably one of the most important aspects of what Socrates uh, gave uh, as far as a foundational element of philosophy is how to do it, how to do philosophy. And of course, this is by the Socratic method or the dialectic, uh, as Plato would say. Um, and that's by this question asking, this clarifying of terms, this establishing the relationship with someone, um, getting them to uh, say what they mean when they use specific terms, especially loaded, emotionally charged terms, or even even perhaps more applicable is terms that are just taken for granted. You know, kind of like uh, Augustine joked about time. Everyone knows what time is until you ask them what it is. Then when you ask someone what time is, all they can give you are examples. No one can give you, it seems like, at least in his day, no one can give you the essence of what it is. So even maybe terms that are just taken for granted, you're just asking questions. You ask how they come to those particular conclusions. Um, what, is their evidence, what is their evidence for that? Why do they hold that view again? Which is just like Google's Colombo tactic. And then, to, and, and then the way you start to point out the flaws or you get them to recognize the problems is by asking a question uh, in regards to that particular conclusion or putting it in the form of an argument that or the reductio absurdum or counterexamples that draw out absurd or contradict contradictory uh, conclusions. So hopefully that at least gives you something to look, look at and, and chew on as you think about Socrates, as you think about how he went about doing philosophy. Uh, but then also too, if you want to go into more depth, I would suggest something like Lawhead referred to Copleston's uh, text. Lawhead's was, would be the voyage of discovery, Copleston's would be history of philosophy, um, and then uh, just the, the section that deals with Socrates. Again, so going back, highlighting our main points with Socrates, his, his ideas were a reaction, and uh, at least uh, we, I don't want to say all completely a, rela a reaction, but in part a reaction to what the sophists were peddling in the day. Um, and he wanted to establish a good foundation about how to go about how to do philosophy. Um, so there you go. Hopefully that gives you something to chew on, on the philosophy and theology porch. Um, again, take it, use it, employ it, live it, love it, whatever, however it goes. Now, get off the porch. Now, before you actually, whoa, I don't want to do that, all right? Before we actually disappear here, there's, I, what I, I actually have something here that I want to listen to as a bonus in regards to this, in, in regards to Socrates. And what that's going to do, or what it's going to be, I should say, is it's going to be a discussion in regards to some possible Socratic uh, questions. Um, in regards to current um, ideologies, uh, cultural, political, cultural type ideologies, how they may be employed um, in that regard. Now, what I want to do is play that for you, and I'm going to keep the slides up here. Um, so just keep that in mind right there and watch this, Go through, continue to go through this bonus section in the Socratic method. Again, the point of this, what it's going to do, and you'll hear me say this here, but what it's going to be, the point is it's going to say, all right, let's look, what if we took, what if Socrates was here now 
and he was going to imply or apply the Socratic method, this Socratic dialogue uh, to current um, cultural positions. So let's give this a listen here. Here we go. Um, and I don't want to become overly political or you know, that sort of jazz and as, as it relates to this particular podcast uh, and the overall theme of this podcast. But if there are uh, certain philosophical underpinnings as it pertains to certain political positions, uh, certain persuasions, which is, of course, going to happen, then, of course, I don't see that as being out of bounds um, for some sort of philosophical <clears throat> diatribe. I was going to say discussion, but seeing as how you are there and I'm here and there's a great gulf fixed in between us that you cannot cross and I cannot cross, uh, this will have to be a monologue in that sense, unfortunately. However, having said that, um, I was thinking about how this relates to what we spoke on in our last podcast about Socrates and his reaction to uh, sophistry or the sophists um, and how this part of his reaction was uh, simply to seriously question uh, their denial of objective standards of uh, of categories of, of objective categories of truth, so on and so on. And uh, uh, part of his, again, as we discussed last episode, was just his method, his, his tactic, maybe as Coco would say, uh, his method of of of, uh, of being an inquisitor, uh, as he challenged their their arguments. And so. Having said that, if we were to play the role of Socrates in some sense, if we were to put ourselves in the position of, of, of asking these questions, specifically as it pertains to, say, a sophist arguing um, that there are no objective standards, uh, there is no objective uh, category of truth, that is, objective truth doesn't exist. And again, we're, we're, we're generalizing here some of these sophist-type positions. But at the same time, these are not positions uh, that people uh, don't hold to now. They do. Um, and, of course, they if we were to trace them back, they do have their roots in, in the sophists, um, generally speaking. Now, part of what we want to do here is we want to challenge the presuppositions of some of these of some of these uh, ideas or these ideologies and not to be confused with presuppositionalism. That is a particular apologetic method that I do not hold to and do not think holds well um, in regard to it being a system. But philosophy has always challenged presuppositions. This is not, uh, this is not monopolized by some particular methodology as an apologetic philosophy, just as a discipline, has always gone after presuppositions, gone after what people have taken for granted, challenged assumptions. Uh, Jiminy frickin' cricket, I mean, this is what we see Socrates doing in uh, the works that we have, that we can, uh, with the text that we can read and record some of his dialogues. Anyway, having said that, I've noticed that there is often this, this tension between a group now we're going on to the subject that we that we that I had planned on going to after my however long that rant was that introductory rant. So I've I've noticed this this tension between a or among a group that has consistently wanted to label themselves progressive. So I've often pondered an apparent absurdity, and that is almost always held in tension within a certain group again within society. The belief that morality is subjective and relative. And like I said earlier, simultaneously claiming the label of liberal progressive. Now, of course, the tension is revealed in the question. And again, this is where we're playing this, the, the Socrates here. We're, we're playing with the Socratic method here. Suppose that we're speaking to one of these individuals and we reveal the tension in this question. 
If one believes that morality is subjective to each individual, and there exists no truly objective or absolute moral truths, then what is the grounding for labeling oneself a progressive, which is almost always in reference to views concerning social morality and or positions? Now, why should this question be considered a problem? Well, because the very meaning of progression, think about this, the very meaning of progression implies that one is actually moving towards an objective standard that society is progressing towards, that it's going to an objective standard by which society can measure its progress. Again, think about this. It's an, there's a, it presupposes or it assumes an objective standard by which society can measure its progress to a morally superior position from which it has held or is currently holding. Does that make sense? To say that you're progressing implies, it just assumes that you're moving from an inferior position, usually by some, some societal moral position, to a better position. Now, how is this logically possible for those that hold or label themselves as progressives, I should say, when many of the same individuals have simultaneously, here's the key, when many of the same individuals have simultaneously argued that no such objective standard exists and that morality is determined by each, by, uh, excuse me, each individual's own subjective notion of right and, and wrong. And of course, this is across the board. You could blow this up into well, the society says, or culture says. So that's really irrelevant for this point here. Now, if no such objective standard exists, then there is literally nothing for liberal progressive to progress towards. Let me say that again. If no such objective standard exists, then there is literally nothing for liberal progressives to progress towards. One would only be justified in saying that we are moving this way or we're not moving that way or we're going in this direction. But certainly one's not justified in claiming that one is truly progressing by any sort of objective or absolute point. To say that one is a progressive one must hold that there is an objective standard that society may truly progress towards or progress towards. But again, if morality is relative, <laughs> then it just seems there is no objective standard. It seems that in order for one to be a consistent liberal progressive, one must either adopt the existence of an objective standard of moral positions, again, saying this ad nauseum, that may be progressed towards or deny that one is actually a progressive. That seems to be the position that you're in. If you're going to hold a, hold the, the, uh, the label as a, as a liberal progressive. Again, that position seems to be, it seems that in order for, for one to be a consistent liberal progressive, one must either adopt the existence of an objective standard of moral positions that may be progressed towards or deny that one is actually a progressive as there's not truly such a thing in the absence of a standard. Now, I guess you could just simply claim that you are a liberal mover or some such term. That, that just seems to be the problem here. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that uh, this particular insight is, is, uh, is, is, locked up within me, my own mind, for instance. I had a friend, a uh, philosopher, Mark Linville, that pointed out that uh, he's a Chesterton fan, a G.K. Chesterton fan, as, as well as I am. And he points out, hey, look, yeah, Chesterton made this same point, of course, in the late 1800s. He said this. This is what Chesterton, Chesterton said, G.K. Chesterton. Uh, I think it's from his book, Orthodoxy. It's this, quote, this, therefore, is our first requirement about the ideal towards which progress is directed. It must be fixed. And then he uses the name here, Whistler. 
Whistler used to make many rapid studies of a sitter. It did not matter if he tore up 20 portraits, but it would matter if he looked up 20 times and each time saw a new person sitting placidly for his portrait. So it does not matter, comparatively speaking, how often humanity fails to imitate its ideal. For then, all its old failures are fruitful. But it does frightfully matter how often humanity changes its ideal. For then, all its old failures are fruitless. The question, therefore, becomes this. How can we keep the artist discontented with his pictures while preventing him from being vitally disconnected with his art? How can we make a man always dissatisfied with his work, yet always satisfied with working? How can we make sure that the portrait painter will throw the portrait out of a window instead of taking the natural and more human course of throwing the person sitting for the portrait out of the window? Now, if, if memory recalls, and I could be wrong here, it, it seems like that that's the context of that is also where Chesterton says something like, in order for man to change, he must change according to the ideal. Uh, but instead, we as humans always find ourselves just trying to change the ideal. Uh, anyway, it's one of my favorite passages. Now, th this sort of idea <clears throat> about there being this some sort of standard and how the standard is usually already argued against by the very people that want to hold to or again, quote unquote, label themselves as, as liberal progressives in some sort, it seems like there's always this raging inconsistency or this, this, this super tight tension between what they want to label themselves and uh, the, the direction of the position that they're actually trying to hold. So for instance, or in parallel fashion, this is why I believe it ought to be argued that it makes no sense for an environmentalist that simultaneously holds to materialistic a materialistic version of Darwinism. That is to say, to argue what is and isn't natural for human beings to do in the environment. So, for instance, if a beaver wanders onto the property of a farmer, dams up his creek, resulting in the devastation of his fields and his crops, then the beaver has done nothing wrong, as it is simply doing what it's evolved to do, right? So in like fashion, under materialistic Darwinism, say an atheistic account of Darwinism, if man wanders over into the rainforest and constructs smokestacks that reach into the clouds, resulting in the devastation of that rainforest, then the man, as a species, has done nothing wrong, as they're just simply doing what they've evolved to do. Now, of course, in contrast, if there were something like a, a like a creator that composed some sort of objective created order, all caps, that should not be violated. And when I say all caps, I mean, as in, I mean, I'm trying to imply that there's some sort of standard there that some creator has made, that this is the way the objective created order, the way things ought to be, and it shouldn't be violated. And even perhaps that man should be a steward over in some sense. It seems that that would be the only true grounding for something like a robust environmentalism, a robust, uh, healthy way to look at the environment in regards to caring for it. Um, because again, if we're just we're just doing what we've evolved to do, which is it seems to be usually the 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 the, uh, the worldview or the philosophical assumption that most people hold to, that are also at the same time raging environmentalists, that they deny objective standards, they deny some sort of creator, they deny some sort of transcendent uh, being outside of time and space that has made the earth as it is. Usually they hold and embrace and radically embrace some sort of materialistic, physicalistic, uh, atheistic version of, of Darwinism revolution. And again, I'm not, I'm not saying anything wrong in principle with evolution. I'm just saying uh, that may very well be the case. I'm just talking about some sort of atheistic version or materialistic or physicalistic type uh, version of, of, uh, of Darwinism. If they radically hold to something like that, but then at the same time rage against what man does against the environment, when it just seems like they lose their metaphysical ground, so to speak, for their argument to get off the ground. 
Again, men, animals, we're just doing what we've evolved to do. Now, you may not like that, what we've evolved to do. Sure, of course. In fact, I hope you don't like that, that people build smokestacks in the middle of the rainforest or whatever the case may be, throwing Budweiser cans into their neighbor's yard. But the point is, it seems like you can only say the environment ought to be some certain way if, again, there's some objective standard by which you're judging that, by which, say, a creator has made the environment originally in its pristine state that it was not intended to depart from. And you could be a steward over that particular uh, creation. And you try to get back to or hold to or, or upkeep this better state, this intended state of an environment. Just like, just like, it seems like there must be some sort of standard if you want to be a liberal progressive and go towards that standard in moral positions, societal positions. So, I even have uh, something marked uh, down here from a uh, conversation that I had with uh, my friend Mark Linville. And this was just an informal conversation, but somehow or other, I ran across it again and have it, have it where it was marked here. And it just was simply, this is what Mark says, and I hope that it's okay that I, uh, that I quote, him, quote him here. He says, I don't know how one can get an environmental ethic up and running in the first place without first being able to define what constitutes harm to the environment. For instance, we should be able to say that the reason it is wrong to clear cut an old growth forest, because this is to cause environmental damage and all else equal, we all not cause such damage, but glaciation radically transformed the northern half of this continent, speaking of the North American continent, and no doubt wiped out existing local ecosystems, eventually replacing them with new species, species and interactions. Is the current natural state better or worse than it was before the ice advanced and receded. Now, we might be able to answer that if better and worse are understood, say, anthro, uh, in an anthropomorphic sense, or anthropocentrically, better or worse for us, or theocentrically, i.e. compared to divine intents and purposes. Now, but the hardcore environmentalist typically reject such frames of reference. Deep ecologists, quote unquote, wish to have a geocentric moral foundation. We have direct duties to the earth itself. But given the fact that the earth itself may undergo such radical transformations, it's hard to see where to find grounds. Again, he's talking about metaphysical grounds here for saying that one natural state is any better or worse than another. Now, we see why these philosophical underpinnings, these philosophical assumptions play heavily into all aspects of life, how they, they run across uh, the board, so to speak, or, or let's put it this way. They sneak out of the philosophy classroom. They Maybe they go up under the door, they fall out of the student's backpack, and they infiltrate society. They, they permeate the way we think about things, the, the things we, we hold to. In fact, it seems like we're just geared, uh, it seems like we're just hardwired to think this way about whatever the topic may be. So drawing this thing, this little side topic to a close about Socrates and how he might apply some sort of method um, or some sort of dialectic, some sort of question, some sort of uh, question and answer session as it pertains to some of these, these uh, stances that are held by people in our society that may closely resemble a sophist position. Again, apologies to anyone that is being overgeneralized here, but that's just how I see it. That's how it works. It seems like that we're applying or, or trying to be faithful to what Socrates might do in such a, such an instance. So again, what does that mean? It just means that, wait a minute, you, Say we're Socrates here and we're in front of our, 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 our friend across the room at the party for Athens, you know, 2016. And uh, 
or Socrates here and we just say, hey, look, don't you label yourself a progressive? What do you mean by that? Or what does the word, what does the word progress mean? And then Socrates draws out the example, wait a minute, was I not at your political rally or your university classroom where you also argued that societal ethics and societal moral positions were just determined by just that society and or even possibly individuals at best. Well, doesn't this, or, or does this undermine your position that, that your, that your ideas are progressing towards any sort of objective standard that exists in reality or just something that you yourself like? Could you clear that up for me? Could you see, or could you try to reconcile those two positions? So maybe something like that. Then let's say he swaps over, he swaggers over, or he limps over, or he jogs over, or maybe he falls through, whatever, over to another person who labels themselves some sort of environmentalist, but also holds to just a, a rabid or a strong materialistic, physicalistic version of, say, material of, of evolution, but then also labels themselves an environmentalist that it in that we're breaking some uh, behavior that we ought not to break in regards to the behavior, to uh, to the environment itself, as if we have some sort of obligation. Now, there's a lot. Now, <clears throat> so I'm hoping that you're able to connect the dots there as to how the, the that's my hope anyway, that you're able to connect the dots as to how those two um, questions as, as far as it pertains to an atheistic version of evolution and uh, how that relates to being an environmentalist and how something like being, at least in our current culture now, uh, what's typically called progressive will be the loudest in regards to inherent rights and those sorts of things to, for individuals, but at the same time holding to the relativism of morality. Right. And how these are inconsistent positions. And I'm hoping that you're connecting the dots as to how the Socratic method, how Socrates, if he were to come back on the scene now and say, you know, get clarification as to what they mean by an atheistic account of evolution and then get uh, clarification as to what they mean by um, what they mean by uh, uh, pollution or environmentalism and then him connecting the dots. Well, wait a minute. These these two uh, positions are inconsistent in some in some way. Right. And then also the same in regard to uh, the other topic there about relativism and, and uh, uh, morality being progressive. But what are you progressing towards, right? All right. So anyway, I just wanted to wrap this section up on Socrates um, up with that and see how that may play out uh, in something like a modern cultural context there. Um, now, having said that, see you next lecture.